welcome to our next episode of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. And uh, this week we're going to be talking about diabetes in dogs. Last mm-hmm. week we talked about diabetes in cats. Before we go on to that, we had a really fun time Saturday. We actually yes. did our pet pictures with Santa. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank all the people who came out with their pets and made the donations to support the TLC Animal Shelter. We raised almost $500. We're just going to top that off. We'll send five hundred dollars to the shelter, so that's mm-hmm. going to provide a lot of care for a lot of animals yep. uh, this holiday season. So thank you very much. All right, diabetes in dogs is quite a bit different than diabetes in cats yes. in the terms that dogs are usually type one diabetics, mm-hmm. so their body is not producing insulin. In cats, we talked about they're producing insulin, but they can't really use it very well. In dogs, they just stop using it most of the time. Now, I have seen some type two diabetic dogs, but it's very rare. very rare. Yeah. Symptoms are going to be very similar to what we see in cats. The increased thirst, increased urination, and weight loss is going to be one of the more common things we see. Um, Increased appetite, of course, as well, because they're feeling hungry. Even Mm -hmm. though they've got all the sugar in their blood, they just can't use it. They can get tired. Urinary tract infections are big in dogs, too. Mm -hmm. And probably the most shocking symptom I see is the diabetic cataracts that form in dogs. Where over almost overnight, their eyes will turn white. Mm -hmm. The... Cataracts or sugar gets into the vitreous, the fluid in their eye, and it causes the lens to swell and it just turns white and they become instantly blind. Yeah. Um, so it's something that we want to we can avoid by getting them on insulin early and treating them appropriately. But once that happens, unless you can find someone that wants to take those uh, cataracts out, um, they're going to be stuck with it. Yeah. And a lot of surgeons don't want to operate on diabetic animals because mm-hmm. of the complications and risk of infections. Yeah. Well, we do. A lot of times the blind pets, can they can survive. They adapt, just, very, they well, adapt yeah. very well with uh, it. Just don't move the furniture around drastically <laughs> on them. Exactly. Um, there is a predisposition in certain breeds. Mm-hmm. So um, schnauzers, miniature yeah. and standard schnauzers are there, poodles. Yeah. Um, Australian terriers, hmm. spitzes, Bichon frise. Samoyeds and quiche hounds are, are overrepresented, hmm. but we see diabetes in every breed of dog. We see it in mixed <laughs> breeds of dogs. Mm-hmm. So just because you're not one of the breeds doesn't mean it's a possibility, but if we've got a schnauzer coming in that's drinking more water, we're going to definitely be zooming in on diabetes mm-hmm. before anything else. And then just like in cats, uh, treatment's going to be insulin, but in dogs' case, it's going to be lifelong. There's yeah. really not much of a chance to get them off that insulin. Um, we typically use a Vetsilin product for the dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, it's dosed properly for them. It's the 40 units, so it makes it really easy to, uh, 40 units per milli, so it makes it easy to dose the smaller dogs, yeah. so, which is very important. We'll also um, recommend a, a diet that's usually a high fiber diet. And the reason yeah. why that's recommended is the fiber that they, in their gastrointestinal tract can slow down the absorption of the carbohydrates into their bloodstream. So when we're giving them a shot of insulin, it's going to last for several hours. We want that sugar to be coming into their blood for several hours as well. So that way we can avoid huge spikes in their blood sugar Mm -hmm. after eating. Um, In terms of feeding them, a consistent diet is important. Treats can be really a problem for them because Mm -hmm. a lot of treats have carbohydrates. Last year for our newsletter, we made some diabetic treats (laughs) for dogs, and we had a diabetic dog taste test them. And (laughs) And she loved them. She loved them. (laughs) So uh, you can look up our newsletter from last uh, November. It'll be in there. But uh, just look on the Internet for diabetic treats for dogs, mm-hmm. and it's probably the best thing to do. Um, there are some places that do manufacture, but look at the carbohydrate and the yeah. sugar content on those ingredients to make sure that it's not going to be a problem for them. Or the biggest thing is just ask your vet, because a lot of, the, a lot of uh, special veterinarian diets do come out with diabetic treats. Yeah, um, this is true. And we used to carry those treats here, so, you know, if you're – vet carries food a lot of times they are going to carry the special treats with them as well or they can special order them because we have special ordered them for diabetic animals before yeah um be wary there's a lot of these uh, internet treatments out there yep. uh just like for cats that prepare, uh, propose that they can treat diabetes cure diabetes in dogs um some of these may be helpful but they're not going to treat your dog no. if your vet says, says your dog needs insulin they need insulin. Mm-hmm. And if they don't get insulin, eventually their body's just going to continue to break down and they will get into the diabetic neuropathies and kidney failure and liver mm-hmm. failure, poor circulation, all the things that you'll see in people. Mm-hmm. Um, Testing is going to be very similar to what we do in cats because we're feeding them a very consistent diet. We're going to just spot check blood sugars here and there. Um, some people do get the home test kits to be able to test their pet's blood sugar um, between times when they're seeing the vet. 
The fructosamine test that checks the blood sugar over a couple of weeks is also a useful test in the, in the diabetic dogs. But in dogs, we see a lot of other things that can complicate our being able to manage them well. Yeah. The biggest one, I think, is Cushing's disease. Yeah. That's where their adrenal glands are overactive and they're producing a lot of cortisone in their blood mm -hmm. that can make it very difficult to get them regulated. Yeah. So we'll get the Cushing's disease under control and then attack the diabetes. <laughs> Same thing with thyroid disease. You can have a dog that's low thyroid and the, if you correct that, they can drastically alter their need for insulin going mm -hmm. forward. So it's important when we're testing them that we evaluate everything going on there to make sure that it's, it's not a problem. So I think that covers pretty much it for diabetes in dogs. Um, very serious thing, very, yes. unfortunately, probably about the same rate as we see in cats, about one in 200, mm -hmm. one in 100 dogs that we see will develop diabetes at mm -hmm. some point. It's not a death sentence for the animals. No. It's not difficult to give these shots. Once you've got over the initial fear of giving your poking your animal <laughs> your pet with a needle, it's really not that difficult. No. And I've seen this in dogs, I've seen it in cats. They get to know that that shot makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. And they'll come and remind you, hey, time for my insulin shot. Well, and again, the needle's so small, most of the times they don't even feel it. Like. Right. Give them the insulin while they're eating. Again, I did it for my dog. She That's thought she was just idea. getting the best love. She, she was like, I'm getting love and food. She didn't even know she got poked 90% of the times. Just make it fun. Right. <laughs> All right. I think we're ready to move on to pet health news. Okay. All right. So we've got some really interesting stories here today. This one is is a rare condition that can affect dogs. It's a, The title is called The German Shepherd Stuck in Perpetual Puppyhood. And what this dog has is pituitary dwarfism. Yes. So he's a German Shepherd. He's going to look like a puppy all of his life. <laughs> okay, his name's Ranger. And they uh, knew he was going to be a problem because he was a runt of the litter and he really wasn't growing. Um, one of the things, though, you know, they treated him for a parasite because they thought maybe that was the issue. Uh, so he treated him for coccidia. Then he later developed giardia. And they treated <laughs> that. Maybe, maybe that was the problem. Um, but they realize, hey, there is something genetically going on here and it's affecting his hormones and everything. They also started to see some other problems with him in that he was actually starting to um, have weight problems and hair loss and dry, flaky skin. And they were on a, uh, I guess it's a Facebook uh, page for mm -hmm. people who have these dogs that suffer from pituitary dwarfism and somebody recommended, hey, have your vet check the thyroid levels. Apparently, low thyroid is a very common thing associated with the pituitary dwarfism, which kind of makes sense because the pituitary does control the thyroid glands, and if it's messed up, you can have that. So they got him on a thyroid supplement, and he's been doing really good um, with that. So they anticipate, you know, he's going to have a healthy life. It's going to be definitely a shorter life than you'd expect. But boy, having a puppy... <laughs> Forever. Forever. Kind of <laughs> like someone's dream. If they could just like make sure that they would live normal lives, then it would be even a neater thing. So good luck to Ranger and his owners. And, you know, it, it's a rare condition. We've, we've, uh, I've never seen a case. Have you seen that? I have never seen a and case. You hear to see the stories yeah. once in a while. So it doesn't necessarily mean a problem for your dog, but it's just kind of a neat thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we talked uh, a couple months ago about a vaccine that they're going to come out for yeah. cats to help uh, deal with allergies, people's allergies to cats. Mm -hmm. Well, this researcher from Prina has said, hey, we may not even need to do that. There's working on an experimental diet that can actually bind up huh. the FELD1 um, antigens that cause the allergies and make the people uh, less symptoms. Well, so cool. apparently it's some sort of egg protein uh, that's added to the diet uh, as an egg product, um, and it's containing a chicken antibody. Hmm. So um, maybe this is a, a, another way of kind of short-circuiting the immune system and giving them this antibody that binds up the protein. Huh. Um, and then they can re they've been able to reduce, by feeding this diet, the levels of the uh, feline, the FELD1 antigen in the environment. Um, so when they uh, evaluated people to see what symptoms they would do, they did notice a, rep a decrease in sniffles, congestion, and itchy eyes. Wow. So it's kind of neat that the, they're able to do this stuff. Um, what they did for the test is they, they, people with calories spent three hours in a six-by-six six exposure chamber <laughs> loaded with blankets <laughs> covered with cat hair, oh, real or fake, and then they determined whether the cats had ate a certain diet and see which ones provokes fewer <laughs> symptoms. So they didn't actually have to sit with the cat, which was kind of nice. That would probably make okay. them miserable. 
So they had eight cats in the diet, four on a control, and four fed the test diet. Hmm. And during the four weeks, the blankets were used by the cats were collected and loaded into the exposure chambers. Hmm. Um, so they did a, a process first where they, um, they did priming. Uh, where they exposed the people to the, the high levels of the FEL D1 antigen. Then they exposed them to the blankets from either the control cat diets or the double blind, in a double blind random fashion. So nobody knew which blankets were from the cats that were being fed the diet okay. or even which cats were being fed the special diet. So they did show that there was a significant reduction in the test diet blankets when compared to the control diet blankets when they measured the, the FEL D1 antigens. And... Um, mm. The, uh, when they uh, exposed the people to it, they definitely had significant improvement in their upper airway symptoms um, as well. Cool. And they've been starting to feed this to some uh, cats that of people who have allergies in their homes, and they're starting to see some improvement. Oh, that's cool. So, boy, yeah, if uh, Purina comes out with the feline anti-allergy diet, that's going to be amazing. That's going to be a game changer. Imagine how many cats get to stay home then. Right. Aren't and people get who re-home. really want to have cats but can't live can't around them. Yeah. They live with somebody who loves cats, and they've given mm-hmm. them up because they want to be with that person. Yeah. Which is not a sacrifice I would necessarily make, but some people do. I, yeah, I would. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> They can go before my cat. Um, and then we have another study here, and this is a study that w- was asking a question. And this maybe seems uh, intuitive, but they wanted to check see if arthritis in dogs affects their mood, yeah. mainly because they found that in people, people with bad arthritis, it can affect their mood, oh, cause yeah. depression, things like this. I can see that. So this is a study they're working on going forward. So they're starting to enroll dogs with this, and they're looking for um, the first will be two groups. Um, one will be dogs six years of, of age and over 25 pounds who are showing signs of osteoarthritis or stiffness. And the second group will be similar age dogs that don't have any symptoms of it. And so they're going to monitor their home environments where they'll be asked to perform simple behavioral tasks after they've been trained to do them, such as flipping a cardboard lid for, um, for a bowl in order to find a hidden treat. And the dog's motivation, motivations will be gauged based on how willing they are to perform the task. So that's kind of a, you know, are you in the mood to play? Yeah. That's maybe a really good way to assess how a dog is feeling. Yeah. If they're not in the mood to play, then that can tell you maybe they are being affected mm-hmm. by this. So they're going to be evaluated by veterinarians who will uh, perform complete physical exams and special pressure sensors to measure the joint sensitivity, which kind of reflects the dog's level of pain. So that'd be interesting to see when those results come out. I'm pretty sure that they're going to find that the, it does affect their mood. Oh, yeah. But having that extra evidence really kind of gives us another tool to say, hey, People might say, my dog's not painful when they've been diagnosed with arthritis. But we can say, you know what? If you want your dog to be not only less painful, but more playful, more Mm -hmm. active, more the dog they want, definitely treat that osteoarthritis Mm -hmm. and get that pain under control. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're in pain or if you have hip issues, you don't want some pain medication, too. And I don't know why people think it's different for animals. Yep, right. And definitely it's going to affect their their attitude. Mm -hmm. And dogs live to play. Yeah. when I first, uh, we talked about the joint supplements last week, when I was able to get dogs on some of those joint supplements and people saw that, hey, now they're playing fetch again, they're mm-hmm. running in the yard, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. All right. Um, case of the week. Um, this week I want to talk about something not related to what we're, we're dealing with in the, uh, the topic, the wellness topic, but um, I have this patient, Little Bit, been seeing for years. And Little Bit is one of these cats <laughs> that has a chronic upper respiratory infection. So she keeps getting uh, drainage from her nose, and it can be clear or watery, or sometimes it gets really cloudy and thick, Mm. yellow or green. Um, And this is from a chronic upper respiratory infection. And unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do to cure these cats. Kind of rule out the obvious Mm -hmm. things. Then you're left with these chronic viral infections. Um, Some cats respond well to um, lysine supplement. It's an amino acid that can help suppress... um, the rhinotracheitis virus, mm-hmm. although um, in the labs it doesn't show much of an effect, but clinically it seems to. Yeah. It's really kind of weird uh, yeah. situation. A um, little, uh, little bit unusual because we can't really give a little bit oral medications. Mm-hmm. We'll not take antibiotics. <laughs> if she did, I would put her on doxycycline, which is a great antibiotic for some of these upper respiratory infections. Um, but she responds well. To two medications. One is a long-acting antibiotic injection when the snots get really yellow or green. Mm-hmm. The other is a long-acting cortisone injection, okay. which reduces the inflammation in the upper airway. So again, it's not treating the infection, it's not curing anything, it's just treating symptoms, yeah. which sometimes that's all we have to do. Mm-hmm. 
Makes you feel better. Um, there used to be a nasal vaccine for cats. They still, I think it's still available. That would vaccinate it for rhinotracheitis and Khaleesi virus in their nasal passages. Mm. And the yeah, theory was if you stimulated the IgA antibodies that are in the mucous membranes, that you might be able to keep these infections under better control. I don't see that going well with cats. Cats don't like it. <laughs> and it didn't work in every cat, but I did have some cats that actually responded to it and huh. did better. They still need to get that vaccine every year, so we couldn't do it every three years like we do with the injectable. Yeah. yeah. But it did make a, some improvement for them if they had that as an underlying cause. Mm. Some people were thinking, boy, it's not really producing specific antibodies to the, that. It's just priming the immune system in the upper yeah. respiratory tract. However it works, it seemed to work for them. Mm-hmm. Um and then one of the things that we you can do, especially if you have a patient that would be amenable to treatment with oral <laughs> medications, is getting a, a PCR test, which is yeah. a DNA test that we can do. We swab their nasal passages in the back of their throat, and we send it to the lab, and they will actually check for the DNA of any specific organisms. Mm. So sometimes getting a diagnosis, it may not change what we're able to do, but knowing what we're dealing with yeah, can be helpful absolutely. long term. And if it, boy, it looks like they've got a mycobacterium or some other infection that might respond to doxycycline, some other antibiotic, we might be able to get those inf- those symptoms to be a lot better. Mm-hmm. Typically, they have a mixed infection, so they'll have um, antibi- uh, any, uh, bacterial infections, viral infections mixed together, and it's just a mixed bag there that you have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, tech tips. Now, this is one, as it's getting colder, and I had a, a patient today who's got skin issues, and it's supposed to be bathing them every week, and mm-hmm. you just find it hard to bathe them in the winter. So yes. I was wondering if maybe you had some tricks on how to deal with this. She said the biggest complaint she had was not so much giving the cat, the dog, the bath, but then the dog wanting to crawl in the bed with her all wet mm-hmm. <laughs> afterwards. Yep. <laughs> During the winter time, it is kind of hard to, you know, give your dogs a bath, especially when you have bigger ones and you're used to using the water holes and everything outside. Um, But a lot of times people have to think, too, during the winter time, you know, you don't want to give them as many baths because you're going to dry their skin out during winter as well. Um, There are a lot of tricks of the trade out there. Um, A lot of times uh, shampoos come in a dry form. So it's like a hand soap where it's foam and you just pump it. Like a mm -hmm, mousse. Exactly. And then you can just rub it across your body. That it dries up on itself. You don't have to worry about trying to rinse the pet off. Um, it does help with um, getting some of the smell away, but it also helps condition the skin and everything right. like that. It does. Yeah. Come, they do come in different forms. So if they have like dry, flaky skin, they have oatmeal shampoos. Okay. Um, if you have dogs that like to go outside and roll around and poop or something like that, they do have uh, odor blockers or things like that that help smell good. Um, or even for like smaller dogs or puppies, they have um, baby like shampoo wipes, and they look like baby wipes, but there's an actual dry. They're called dry bath wipes, and oh. you can use. Mm-hmm, and you just use them, and you just comb it through their fur. And a lot of times, you will notice that they do pick up a lot of dirt and debris from the skin and everything. Mm-hmm. And you never have to worry about the dog feeling wet. Um, I did it when I was younger, when I had a little like pity mix and she had short fur, which helped out a lot. And we would do this during the winter for her and she would never feel wet. But after each wipe, she would get felt cleaner, cleaner. Her fur would be shiny. Um, and that always helped. And I know they do have the medicated mousses for the dogs, mm-hmm. too. So if your pet's getting a medicated shampoo, ask your vet if they have a mousse form of it. Yeah. And that might be really helpful to at least get the, the animal more treatment mm-hmm. during the winter months. That or if you take your dog to the groomer, take the shampoo to the groomer with you. Right. Um, a lot of times most groomers do, you know, like oatmeal shampoos, especially during the winter, just to help and smell good. But if your dog is specifically on like a medicated shampoo... And you don't want to do it at home, but you want your dog to look pretty for the holidays or something. Take that shampoo to the groomer. They're not going to charge you anything extra. Just let them know, this is the shampoo my dog routinely needs. And they'll do it. Just tell them, don't use anything special um, because you don't want them to react or anything. Um, Or they do have uh, pet stores where you can go in and bathe your dog. Um, I know Pet Supply Plus has a grooming station Mm -hmm. where you go in and you... You're, you're pretty much, you become a groomer that day. They have uh, bathing tubs. They have shampoos, towels, brushes. They even have a drying station. So you can dry your pet off before they yeah. leave. Um, and then that way, you know, your the pet... blow is dryers? Mm-hmm. That, okay, nice. Yep, so dogs, yeah, the doggy blow dryers. Um, so if it's cold and you want to get your dog a bath because they need it, you can go in, you can put them in a big tub, 
and use the um, their nice high pressure so you can get all the dirt, debris, the soap, everything out. And then they do have a nice pet friendly dryer that you know can dry them off and you can rotate them. Uh, you definitely want to make sure you don't keep that dryer in one spot too long just like with people you can't burn them right. um, but you want to make sure especially for dog with skin issues that you get all that moisture underneath off because a lot of times that moisture that just sits there can be what's causing yeah. some of that infection too right you can you can create worse problems so mm -hmm. so it's a little it's gonna be a lot less expensive than going to a groomer because yeah. you're doing all the work you're doing it yourself but it's gonna be more convenient because you're not dealing with the wet dog in your house mm -hmm. in the tub and especially around the holidays maybe yeah. you don't want to have them running around shaking mm -hmm. wet fur all over the place <laughs> great yeah but biggest those are the biggest things so i think um that definitely will be helpful for my client who's looking for a way to do that so that i think the uh the waterless shampoos the mousses would be a great mm -hmm. alternative for for him and then being able to go to a place where they have a really good dryer yeah like a good dryer yeah. that's what helps too but mostly the waterless shampoo the mousses or even the wipes Mm -hmm. um, I'm more of a fan of the wipes because I tend to use those, especially during the winter when we come in from walks from the salts. Um, and so it's nice to just wipe their paws off in between and everything. But while I do it every now and then, I'll go across their whole body too because they play roll around in snow. You don't know what's in that snow. Yep. Let's keep them clean. Yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> All right. Next week, we're going to stick with the pancreas. And we're going to talk about pancreatitis, okay. which is inflammation of the pancreas. We see that in dogs a lot. Mm -hmm. We do see it in cats. So we're going to, it's going to be a very important thing, especially uh, this is it's going to be after the holidays, but it's a problem. <laughs> Holiday <you see>. season. <laughs> but, well, you're going to be hearing this after Thanksgiving, but uh, do not feed your animals the leftovers. It's not a good idea. Just nope. there right now. So um, that's what we'll talk about next week. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. We'll see you next time.